Hello, everyone. Welcome to Abstracting TE Silicon Implementations with SHIMS. Uh, I am uh, Nathaniel McCollum. I am the CTO of a new startup called Profian. And uh, joining me today is Harold Hoyer, who is our distinguished engineer. Uh, Harold, please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Harold Hoyer. I'm the distinguished engineer at Profian. And I work mostly on uh, AMD's SAE as NMP technologies, SHIMS. Great, thanks Harold. So the project we're gonna be talking about today is the NRX project. And uh, although we're gonna give you a little window into what the project does and how it works, uh, if you would like to get more information, the best place to find that uh, is at the URL that you see here, uh, which is nrx.dev, that's E-N-A-R-X dot dev. So let's move ahead to the next slide. Let me give you a brief overview of the NRX project. Um, so uh, we are a confidential computing uh, platform that uses uh, WebAssembly in order to deploy workloads in the cloud uh, on top of different TE implementations. Uh, this means that um, you can take a, a normal workload compiled in you know, C, C++, uh, Rust, Go, Java, et cetera. Uh, you can compile that to WebAssembly and then you can deploy that WebAssembly binary uh, into whatever TEE that NRX has support for. The NRX project itself is all entirely open source. So uh, all of our code is licensed under the Apache 2.0 license. And uh, we want to be very clear that uh, we take as a strategy uh, that we do not trust the host. Uh, what we do trust, however, needs to be defined. Uh, the first thing that we trust is uh, we trust the CPU and the firmware. And we do this based upon a hardware root of trust in the hardware. Um, it's uh, not theoretically possible to validate a CPU. So this is a leap of faith. However, once we have the root of trust established, uh, everything from that point on is cryptographically verified. So uh, what else do you trust in this system? Uh, besides the CPU uh, and the CPU's firmware, you would also trust the open source NRX runtime. Uh, however, one thing that makes us a bit different than other platforms is that uh, you do not actually uh, have to trust a binary that we provide. You can provide your own NRX binary and you'll see how we accomplish that in a moment. Uh, this means that 100% uh, of the runtime that's within a keep, which is what we call our execution environment, uh, is, is provided by you, the tenant. And, uh, and you get cryptographic uh, verification from the hardware using that root of trust that everything that you have deployed is exactly what you want. Uh, the entire project itself is written in Rust plus some assembly language uh, so that we can uh, issue the right instructions for the hardware. And uh, the NRX project is now supported by a new startup called Profian, uh, of which I'm the CTO. And, um, so first, we're going to start off by uh, identifying what some of our problem sets are. And there's uh, two basic uh, categories here. The first one is uh, the contrast between how these TEEs are implemented. There are sort of two different types. One's, uh, one set is encrypted virtual machines, and the other is process-based TEEs. We'll go over those in a moment. Um, and then the second is we're going to talk about our execution and security principles. So uh, the first thing that we want to talk about is the difference between how the different technologies work at the silicon level. And there really falls in, these really fall into two different categories. So on the one hand, uh, we have things that are process-based. And the way that these actually work uh, is that it allows you to use an API, usually for the kernel, a set of ioctals in the case of, of SGX, um, to carve out a, uh, a region of memory within a process. And that region of memory is uh, encrypted and has confident, or in, uh, it's encrypted and has integrity protections. Depending on the technology that's involved, it also will sometimes uh, deny access, any access to those pages. So, um, so this is essentially the process uh, based TEEs. On the other hand, we have uh, VM based TEEs. And VM based TEEs uh, are roughly what you would expect. You have a virtual machine, and inside of that virtual machine, uh, you have uh, all of the pages encrypted unless you request otherwise. 
And uh, the way that virtual machines work for those who, who aren't aware uh, is basically the hardware creates a, a secondary set of page table mappings. So within a process, you can create this, this virtual machine that has its own page tables. Uh, and then, like I said, uh, the, the encryption of this is controlled usually by the guest. So, um, but we, the problem that we have is we want to present a, a single execution environment to all of these different platforms, regardless of how different they are, uh, because there are different ones that work in different contexts and we want there to be a, a single way to execute code inside uh, of Keeps on all of these different platforms. Uh, and these really are quite different uh, hardware platforms with very different uh, semantics. So we want to abstract these away into a single runtime. Uh, dividing up these into the, the process space, um, we have uh, the pro on the process space, we have the SGX, uh, which is from Intel. And uh, although SGX has been out for a while now, uh, support landed in the Linux kernel uh, only within the last six months. So it is, uh, it is a pretty relatively fresh technology in that regard. Um, also, we have the technology from RISC-V, which is called Sanctum, uh, and, this, and that also follows this, this pattern. On, on the VM-based TEE side, we have uh, AMD provides a technology called uh, SEV, and we are not targeting the early versions of this platform, which did not provide uh, integrity protection and uh, did not, uh, the earliest version didn't encrypt registers for the guest. Uh, so we are uh, starting support at the SEV SNP version, uh, which provides uh, secure nested paging for all of those additional protections. And then uh, we, there's also a product called uh, TDX, which is forthcoming from, uh, from Intel. Uh, although they've announced TDX, we don't know exactly where it's going to come on the, uh, the Intel uh, chip roadmap. So look forward for that in the future. Uh, IBM Power has also additionally offered uh, PEF. Uh, which is a, uh, a technology that's similar uh, to the way that uh, SEV operates. And uh, so that, that was available, I believe, on Power 10. And uh, ARM has also announced uh, Realms. Uh, and, and actually, Realms is able to do both process-based uh, or VM-based TEEs, uh, is my understanding. Um, this is also forthcoming in a new silicon that will be coming your way shortly. So the way that we abstract across all of these is that we use a WebAssembly as a, uh, as a runtime. And so what we want to do is we basically want to have uh, all the hardware stuff uh, lower on the stack, uh, exports a single interface that is usable for WebAssembly. And uh, WebAssembly, of course, is a W3C standard. So this is not something that we are building, our, uh, building ourselves. It's not, you don't write your application to NRCs. Uh, you write it to your, your normal language and your normal APIs, and you compile it to WebAssembly uh, and then deploy it. Uh, WebAssembly also has a set of system interfaces uh, called WASI, WebAssembly System Interfaces. Uh, these are sort of like POSIX syscalls. And so they provide uh, APIs uh, outside of the, the WebAssembly execution environment in order to be able to do syscall things. And then on top of that, there are language bindings that are provided. So for example, the Bytecode Alliance provides a libc implementation on top of WASI. And this means that you can take your C application and you can compile it and link it against the, uh, the Bytecode Alliance libc, which will under the covers use WASI in the same way that under the cover uh, glibc uses uh, you know, Linux syscalls and, and so forth. So applications basically just get to write in their own language. Uh, they have language bindings on top of WebAssembly. And this is all work uh, that is going on in the industry. It's not work that's part of the NRX project, um, but uh, we get to benefit from the, the fruit of this. Uh, so our focus is primarily at the, the WebAssembly layer and below. And uh, what we call all of this, when you combine all of these different comp components into a single runtime environment, we call this a keep. Uh, a keep, of course, refer, refers to the most secure part of a castle. So uh, th that's what we call uh, our trusted execution environments. Let's go through uh, the various different principles that we have in uh, when we talk about our runtime. So the first one is runtime portability. And there's a, a reason, a lot of reasons we want this. Um, the first one is that this, we of course, by this, we mean no recompilation of, of workload. Uh, there's a few reasons why this is really important. Why it's important to be able to take a WebAssembly binary that is uh, instruction set architecture neutral and be able to deploy it on a variety of uh, different technologies. So uh, the first one is function equivalence. And this is um, 
we need to be able to, uh, let, let's say we have performed a task and we get an attestation back uh, that some output was produced by a, a function. Uh, if the function is just native code and has been measured by the specific technology, then uh, what you have is a uh, you have a single measurement that encompasses uh, not only the function but also the uh, all, all of the enablement technology that goes on uh, under the, the SDK or whatever that you're using to build this. And so it can be difficult to tell exactly what function you're actually executing inside of this keep. And uh, this is also true in, and gets even worse when you go across technologies. So if you're building, uh, a, say, a function and you want to deploy this uh, across multiple different technologies, now even the exact same function, even if it has the exact same instruction set architecture, is going to have different measurements because it's produced on, on, a, uh, on a different hardware platform. But what we want to achieve is we want to achieve a function equivalence. So we want to be able to have some easy way to be able to look at an attestation that has been produced over a set of data. And we want to be able to say that, uh, that the two are equivalent. So whether a, a function was run on platform A or whether a, a function was run on platform B, it really doesn't matter. We want to know that the same function was run in both places. And unless we have runtime portability, we can't achieve this function equivalence uh, because of the different technologies involved, because of the different native code, um, uh, you know, that, that's uh, the native instruction set architecture that's running on the hardware platform. Uh, all of these things uh, affect the measurement of the actual function that's run. And so we need some way to be able to provide function equivalence and WebAssembly helps us, helps us to accomplish that. Uh, another important one is that we want to have uh, security as config. Uh, and what we mean by this is that uh, right now, if you create and deploy an application, it's actually quite difficult to determine the status of your security. For example, what certificates is an application using? Uh, what crypto parameters is it using? What you know, hardware resources is is it using? Uh, and all of this is what we base, kind of do now is we throw applications into into a container, uh, or we deploy it on a host, and. At best, we can do security scanning of packages to determine wh whether there's known vulnerabilities uh, on the software stack that we are deploying. But beyond that, there's no real standard way to deploy things like security config, crypto parameters, and so forth. And so auditing of all of this becomes a, a nightmare uh, in practice. And what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to uh, identify our security uh, as configuration in a known way. So for example, if a vulnerability occurs um, on let's say uh, AMD SEV, it really doesn't matter what the technology is, uh, vulnerabilities are going to occur over time. So when a vulnerability occurs, what we want to be able to do is we want to make a configuration de uh, deployment configuration policy change. And we want to shift everything immediately to, uh, to the new policy that we consider to be correct. All of this, of course, is now auditable because everything is in the configuration. And we don't have to sort of infer that from a variety of properties. Everything is explicit. And so we always know exactly what the security properties are of any given deployment at any given time. So uh, being able to do this really requires runtime portability. If we want to be able to move from one platform to another when a vulnerability is discovered, uh, this really requires uh, some ability to have security as, as configuration. So another problem that arises when we are attempting to do confidential computing is the problem of deployment density. And um, unlike traditional VMs, for example, where you can share pages uh, in a uh, hardware protected environment, uh, the memory pages are encrypted and uh, they are typically encrypted in, in some way that's unique uh, per, you know, uh, per TE instance, per VM or so forth. And so uh, what this means is that where before, when we could map a kernel, for example, into, uh, into a VM, we could accomplish a lot of sharing and get high density by sharing pages bet between instances. Well, with confidential computing, that's, that's no longer uh, something that we can accomplish. And so we, since we don't have the ability to share the pages between instances, uh, the, uh, the ability to have minimal overhead and a minimal runtime environment, of course, uh, becomes much more important. And we've already seen efforts to do this even outside of the confidential space. You know, uh, projects like Firecracker, for example, um, are an attempt to uh, distill down to a very minimal uh, you know, VM in order to be able to uh, increase density. Another example of this is GVisor, of course, uh, which again, attempts to do things as minimally as possible and, and increase density. Um, so uh, we need to figure out some way to increase density. This is, this is one of the problems we intend to solve.
We also have the problem of the TCB, otherwise known as the trusted computing base. And uh, this is the amount of code that you have to trust in order to deploy an application. And of course, uh, we want this to be as minimal as possible. Uh, in order, if you have to de depend upon you know, hundreds of megabytes or even gigabytes worth of software uh, just to deploy your application, then uh, you know, that's a large uh, pool of, of places where security vulnerabilities can arise. And uh, so what we want to do is we want to try to uh, reduce our attack surface by having a minimum trusted computing base as, as possible. This also aids in auditability. So when we, of course, Enarx, everything in Enarx is open source and uh, you can come read the code, you can come critique the code. Uh, and we also plan to do, uh, to do audits as a company as well. Uh, the intent here is, of course, that uh, once we have uh, code that is auditable, uh, it's much easier to have a stronger confidence about the security of the software that we're deploying. Uh, the third factor about TCB is that, of course, just having it small also improves the startup time, which is something that's great. So we are definitely, uh, we want to be bound on hardware for the, for the startup time. There is some performance penalty to, penalty to be paid uh, by things like attestation, uh, but this is largely bound by the hardware. So what we want to do is we want to be waiting on the hardware and not waiting uh, on NRX. So and we believe that we can accomplish that uh, in a way that's very minimal. Uh, a fourth principle that's really important is that we want no host supplied bits in the keep. And uh, this is something that arises significantly in other approaches, uh, which is that they, they want uh, the host basically to provide some kind of a runtime or uh, this is particularly true, for example, with, with VMs. With VMs, you basically want to have a, a BIOS that's going to uh, find your bootloader and then load your kernel and so forth. And uh, by having that BIOS, however, we're having something that is injected into the protected area by the, by the host. Uh, this is a fantastic place to put a backdoor or other things like that. And so uh, it's really important. We believe it's really important to keep those bits uh, out of the keep altogether. And uh, the only other way to accomplish this is with an SDK model, uh, which is what projects like the Intel SGX SDK and Open Enclave SGK, uh, SDK are trying to accomplish. And uh, best of luck to all of them. So, uh, but, but we want to make sure that we have no host supply bits in the keep, uh, but we also don't want to depend upon a complex uh, SDK. So uh, uh, this is of course all because our trust model excludes the host. And we want to be sure that everything that is running in the keep is precisely what the tenant supplied and that there are no back doors or any opportunity uh, for them to arise. So how do we accomplish that? Um, well, the answer is we borrow strategies from elsewhere. So although we're going to be introducing uh, some uh, how the NRX project has architected the solution. Um, there's a lot of stuff here that is really just rehashed from other places. And that's because we think it's best, of course, to stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, to uh, go over the details of this, I'm gonna turn over to uh, Harold, our uh, distinguished engineer, uh, to continue. Harold? So our goal is, uh, of course, to have a very minimal kernel uh, in its size and capabilities which makes uh, auditing the whole stuff much easier. It should uh, offload most of the works, uh, work of syscalls to the host. Um, and of course, it, um, we don't need any hardware emulation in the, in, in the guests. So like virtual network devices or disk devices. So the footprint is, is much smaller and easier to secure. <clears throat> This all is uh, good for auditability. Um, again, uh, smaller, and um, I think we can skip that because that protocol is probably the well. Uh, yeah, I think the important thing to note is that we want to have a standardized protocol, something that is uh, standardized uh, from the host to the guest, so that uh, no uh, bits can need to be supplied by the host. The entire protocol uh, is standardized and versioned between the two of them. Harold. Yeah, and our protocol is called Sandaport. The Sandaport is basically uh, the backdoor to the keep <laughs> where all um, the communication is happening. It's very small and secured and um, a guard can basically secure that thing very easily. Um, the host site is basically untrusted for the TEE. And so we have to 
check all what is coming in and all what is going out from our payload binary. On the next slide, we can see um, how our payload here, in our case, our uh, WASM JIT, WebAssembly JIT compiler is the static pi binary, which is running in uh, the TE with the shim as the curl. And it will, um, so you can basically run any static pi binary in our shim, which you can run on, on bare metal. Um, it uses standard syscalls, uh, standard Linux syscalls, and the shim will intercept those and um, um, inspect all the parameters and um, copy over the buffers supplied by the user space, basically the static pi binary as the Linux kernel does. Um, The shim interprets those um, syscalls and serializes them over uh, the Sally part interface into a buffer. This buffer is shared between the host and the shim and is not encrypted. And via some mechanisms, um, the host is then triggered to interpret those data. It will um, deserialize the data, it will verify all the parameters. Um, it does not trust the shim, as the shim does not trust the host. And if finally it uh, has validated um, the syscall, it will execute the syscall on behalf of the shim in the host. Um, the data is then transported back. Uh, the result is transported back over the Sally port um, back to the shim and also validated um, then back to the static pi binary. So we can um, Some, some of the syscalls stay entirely uh, in between, in the keep, like uh, uname or memory mapping syscalls, and they don't have to go outside and, and cause a VM exit or, or an exit to, to the hypervisor, the host. This saves a lot of time in usual non-IO situations. Yeah, pretty much the only thing that goes out to the host is uh, I.O. related stuff. So anything that we can emulate internally, we do. Exactly. And um, maybe maybe threading has to synchronize over the host too. But uh, these are the main things. Um, yeah. And so you can sort of think of the uh, shim as sort of the meat of a sandwich. And on the bottom side of the sandwich uh, is the Sally port interface. Um, back up, I'll show that here. Um, so on the bottom side of the shim is the Sally port interface. And on the top is just your standard Linux syscalls. So the shim emulates the syscalls to the binary and then translate the, translates those over the Sally port. And I think what Harold said is really important about um, the fact that the shim and the host side mutually distrust each other. So this is, uh, uh, the phrase I like to use is adversarial compute, mutually adversarial compute. Uh, we are basically trying to compute in a scenario in which, uh, you know, there's a well-defined interface, which is the Sally port, uh, but the, uh, neither side trusts the other. And so always has to verify uh, all of the, uh, all of the parameters that go across the, the wire. So Harold. Um, yeah, um, the, the host side can of course uh, lie to the shim and provide fake data. And so all, all of the uh, communication happening with the outside world uh, is encrypted basically and um, um, secured by uh, max authentication. Um, and really, really the, the shim should not trust any outside data. So um, the host cannot 
interpret any of the data which is uh, going through IO with the outside world or even with uh, emulated disks. So in, in the next slide, we see that our static bi pi binary is basically um, the uh, WASM JIT compiler interpreting our uh, web assembly application. And together with the shim and the loader, this forms the Anux project. Um, the application is uh, CPU and language agnostic and, and can be deployed in any architecture the Anux project supports now and will support in the future, which is very, without uh, being recompiled, which is very cloud friendly in my opinion. Um, here we see um, the, the root of trust is the Intel CPU uh, with the Anux loader and shim running in, in, the process, in one process space. On the next slide, we see the same thing with an AMD CPU where the loader um, starts a virtual machine where the shim is running in there. So for the application, nothing has changed basically what the application sees. And that's the, the real benefit of having this um, abstracted uh, technology. So thank you. Yeah, we, we would really love to see people get involved with the project. Um, the current status of the project is uh, basically that we are nearing our first release and we hope to have uh, that within the upcoming month, uh, which will have all of the pieces basically put together and will allow you to pretty simply run some web assembly uh, inside of one of the keeps uh, as a de deployment option. Um, there's lots of ways to get involved. Uh, we need people with all sorts of skills so, uh, you know, whether you have low level technical skills, whether you have uh, marketing skills, whether you have uh, really anything, uh, even you just like to be sociable, uh, come see us. There's, uh, first of all, you can follow us on social media. Uh, that's a good way to get updates uh, for the, the project. Uh, there are links coming up in the, in the last slide for that. Um, of course, uh, if you want to uh, try it out, we would love that too. So download, compile it, uh, run test report, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we definitely would like people interacting uh, with it in any way they can um, help us find bugs uh, you know as soon as possible and um, there's really sort of two different kinds of, of people we would like to have interested in, in this regard the first one is people who just wants to um, deploy a workload and our workload runtime is still a little bit immature uh, so uh, you know I would temper expectations about being able to do a lot of stuff with that yet uh, it's going to be coming in the upcoming months uh, as our effort ship shifts from the bottom part of the stack towards the upper part of the stack um, but the uh, the other part uh, that we need is we need people who are just interested in contributing to the low level part of the stack as well uh, there's still a lot of work to be done and uh, we could definitely use your help We'd love people to also just audit our designs and implementations uh, as well. Uh, we do everything in the open and uh, we, we value your feedback. Um, we definitely need help with documentation. Uh, Nick, uh, who is uh, the community manager for the Anarchs project, uh, is, is currently working on documentation, but he could use lots of help. Uh, so feel free to uh, get a hold of him. And then, uh, of course, we need evangelists, right? People who are willing to uh, spread the word about what we're doing. And uh, we would love for you to get involved in any way you can. Um, for those who do want to get involved on a technical basis, um, there's really a lot of different places you can work and you can learn as much as you want. You can go as deep as you want. Um, so if you have um, any expertise with like SEV or SGX or even really just embedded uh, experience, um, you know, those are all very relevant. Uh, if you have uh, experience with WebAssembly, we would love uh, that as well. Uh, either on the compiler side or the WASI side, um, you know, we, we need help not only implementing it, but also um, updating the standards uh, that are being worked on. 
Um, microkernel slash syscall, like if you're familiar with doing that kind of stuff, great. Uh, same for Linux systems programming, like if you're familiar with networking and storage, uh, we would we would love to have uh, you know, one of the most the highest priority items for us in the coming months is going to be getting a network networking our networking stack up and running. Um, we already have it partially running, but uh, there's uh, some specific things we want to accomplish there. So uh, we would love your design input and uh, experience there. Uh, a little bit later, we're going to be working on storage as well. So uh, please come talk to us if you're interested in that. Um, and then of course uh, we need to be able to inter integrate with Kubernetes and OpenShift. So if you just have distributed systems experience and uh, and deploying in cloud, um, you know these are these are all really great relevant skills. Uh, the last two are really just security auditing and research in Rust. Uh, everything we have is written in Rust, with the exception of a little bit of inline assembly. So uh, we would love you if you you know have any of those skills, uh, please come join us. It's really easy to find us. Uh, we're available online at nrx.dev. Um, the chat is uh, just chat.nrx.dev, so pretty easy to find us there. All of our code is available on GitHub, GitHub slash nrx. And uh, we also are available on social media, so you can uh, go to the uh, nrx project on uh, Twitter. Uh, there's a, a URL there for LinkedIn as well. Or you can just search for NRX on YouTube and we have uh, videos uh, of lots of the talks that we've done. So uh, you can see those videos there uh, as well as some other videos. Um, just a reminder, everything we do is, is licensed in Apache 2. So uh, it's all open source and can all be used very widely. And uh, we would we would really love to, uh, to, you know, to have your input. Um, obviously we're pre-recording this talk, so uh, we can't take questions right now. However, I believe we are gonna be online uh, when when this talk is uh, is done online, so we will be able to answer questions there, and uh, we hope to have left enough time to uh, to cover all of those questions. So um, you know, please uh, don't be shy. We would we would love to uh, hear all your questions. All right, thank you very much. It's it's been uh, great chatting with you, and uh, we appreciated the opportunity to let you know a little bit more about the product project. I'd especially like to thank Harold. Uh, for doing this talk and uh, taking time out of his busy development schedule. So uh, thank you everyone uh, who is involved and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.